We're going to take a quick break and talk about Drizzly. Drizzly is fantastic. It's the most convenient way to buy beer, wine, and spirits with delivery to your doorstep. And get this, under 60 minutes. It's insane. Yeah, I think what's also great is you can compare prices and shop different places and get your best deal. And you know, you're you're shopping and you're doing a lot of cooking during the holiday season and you're all busy and all of a sudden you're like, oh, I need that bottle of wine. Wrapping presents and you don't want to have to take time to run to the store. Or you forget a gift yeah. and you need it delivered real quickly. Here's the way to do it. You download the Drizzly app or go to drizzly.com. That's D-R-I-Z-L-Y.com. And Drizzly is giving every new customer $5 off their first order. What's that promo code, Seton? Fast5 at checkout. F-A-S-T-5 at checkout. It's drizzly.com. Hello, this is Discover, and we take customer service very seriously. We know that if you have a question or concern about your credit card, that's a serious matter, and you need to talk to a real person about it. So we offer around-the-clock access to seriously talented representatives in the USA. Again, it's a serious endeavor. The only funny thing about it is Bob. If you call us and Bob answers, you're in for a treat. Get 100% U.S.-based customer service and talk to a real person day or night. Discover exceptionally common sense. It's not too late to make someone's holiday season a special one. Start now as an Amazon delivery station warehouse associate to earn some extra money for the holidays. You'd help bring joy to thousands near you by preparing packages and loading them up for their final delivery. With night and early morning shifts available through the new year, you'd also have the flexibility to spend time with your loved ones. To start as a delivery station associate, go to amazon.com slash holiday work. Amazon is a proud equal opportunity employer. Impact of Influence, the tragic story of a powerful South Carolina family and the mysterious deaths that they are linked to. Hi there, I am Matt Harris and across from me is Seton Tucker. We appreciate you listening as always. This is kind of a part two, if you will, because you asked for questions on our Facebook page, Murdoch Podcast. You can also check out the website, MurdochPodcast.com. You asked about questions from Sarah. Explain who Sarah is again. For those yes, Sarah is a Hampton native, and uh, she came on for the first part of this, and she we will hear a little bit from her in this episode as well. Um, we did uh, receive a lot of feedback that people were kind of upset because they feel like she was too tied to the family. And we will not deny that. She is on here giving a side of the story, and we realize that her side is based on what she knows and what she's lived and her, her interactions with the Murdochs. And we certainly get emails and messages that believe that the whole family are a bunch of criminals. So th there, there's all sides to this, but we gave you her side and her viewpoint, and I think she filled in some of the family tree questions that people had and things like that. So you can take everything at its face value, at its worth. We're not saying we agree with all the opinions. She's giving her opinion of her friends and family and her interactions. So that brings us to part two, where she'll be involved in. I think she's a very nice person. Yes, and she, I mean, it is interesting, regardless of what you feel, to hear from somebody who is local, who has that perspective, because very little local people are speaking out. John Snyder is our legal analyst. We always get great, great uh, love to him whenever we put him on. And so you asked for questions, again, on Facebook, and they came rolling in, not only about current things that are happening, some of the things maybe we covered in the past but didn't go into very deep with John. So we'll get to those. Uh, he is a former DA, uh, former defense attorney, and he's our legal analyst. And we'll get to him. Uh, by the way, it'll sound a little weird because I'm in studio now. And when I was doing the interview with John, I was at home because I was in COVID quarantine. But uh, I'm out of quarantine. Yay, it's good to have you back. It's, it's, I'm glad to be back. And Dwayne's happy to have my smiling face here. He's our producer, and he's uh, good to go. So we will get to John after this word from Founders Federal Credit Union. Would you love to lower your existing auto loan rate by 1%? Look no further than Founders Federal Credit Union. Refinance your current auto loan, and we will beat your existing rate by 1%. Plus, make no payments for 90 days. 
boats, motorcycles, and recreational vehicles are included. And we're talking a lot about boats in this episode. I don't know if they got this right. Never mind. Whether it's for the car you drive daily or the boat that's reserved for the weekends, an auto loan from Founders Federal Credit Union, a smart and affordable way to pay. Founders features flexible terms, low rates, fast, friendly service, and 24-hour account access with Founders Online and the Founders app. Relax with Founders. Don't miss out. Apply today at foundersfcu.com backslash auto or in an office near you. Terms and conditions apply. Membership qualification required. Founders Federal Credit Union is federally insured by NCUA. Current auto loan must be with another financial institution. Let's just begin with some listener questions that were brought to our attention, John. There is one from Nancy Walker, and she says, uh, John Slater thought the bond issue had a good chance of being overturned. Would love to hear speculation about what's going on with the judge. It's interesting, even though the prosecutors were fully prepared to accept bond, he has denied it twice. That is true. He has denied it twice. And it did appear that the state was going to accept bond. Your thoughts on that, John? I think that the judge sees this. There's cases that judges get that they have to kind of override the public pressure and still apply the law properly. And there's a saying among lawyers that hard, hard cases make bad law. And so even though there's a lot of media pressure and a lot of attention on this particular case, you still have to apply the law fairly and evenly and that's the basis of the appeal and you know it is a departure from the standard uh, requirements for bond in South Carolina and I think that's what the prosecution at one point was ready to accept it and what will be what's interesting about the appeal on the bond and on the motion to dismiss I don't want to mix the two questions up too much but I think at this point, you're going to hear Griffin and Harputlian rattle their swords pretty heavily on who's driving the bus here. Is it, is it the state and their prosecution of their case, or is it these private lawyers who are trying to get more money out of the family? And you'll, you're going to hear those words in court would be my bet. One of the questions that Lori Little Sebastian has is wants to know if Alec, you think, is getting special treatment, and is there anything in the legal aspect of the case that would indicate that he is being treated differently due to his family power and legacy in South Carolina. And I think, John, you kind of answered that in the fact that when you have a, tell me, you can tell me I'm wrong, you're the expert, but when you have a case with a big, shiny national spotlight on it, it might not be the same treatment, but it might not be preferential. It might be worse treatment because eyes are on you, right? Yeah, it's a little bit like, again, no one's going to feel sorry for him, but the process has to work evenly and without regard to who you are or what the accusations are. And so at the beginning, he was definitely getting some white glove treatment from the judicial system in Hampton County with, you know, the way the magistrate put the bond in without taking into account the state's opinion. He was getting the benefit of years of networking. Now, the flip side is now he's getting almost penalized, on maybe unduly, on the bond side because of the attention and all the pressure. So the legal system is supposed to be free from bias either direction. And, you know, and then again, one, this is one of those things where depending of your opinion of the legal system, you may say, well, it's, you know, he's finally getting just dessert by getting his bond reduced. And it's like, well, it's only just if it's not happening to you. I think he's got a really good, he's got two of the best lawyers out there, and they are certainly doing their job and earning their fee. And I want to make it very clear so that John's not saying, like he said, cry the blues for this guy. He's just painting the picture for you from a, a legal aspect. There is no John saying, oh, poor Alec, but he's just telling you how it is. Mandy, let's see, Jennifer Frazier Gamble asked, with all the connection in the area, how can the prosecution have a fair trial with any, without any conflicts of interest? Look, I think there's a lot of people that have sworn an oath of the Constitution to serve uh, as members of the bar and to participate in the legal system that they're 
not going to throw away their careers, especially in a case under such scrutiny, you know, cut corners or create edges for people that shouldn't exist. And so I think at this stage, it's possible to get a fair trial with the people working in the system. I just worry, you know, the jury pool is not that big. So the fact that the indictments were brought in different counties indicates that one of these counties could have a motion to consolidate. And so they, they might all be heard in Orangeburg or, or one of the other counties that's listed in the indictments. And so it'll take these cases out of the Hampton County courthouse to be dealt with. Mandy uh, Bessaker Kugel asked, are Alex's brother and former law partner are suing him only to funnel money back to him or Buster? We a bit covered that, but I think what you're going to say, John, is that uh, they did it so they can get to the front of the line. Is that right? I think two things. One, they have a, they have a moral obligation to recover money on behalf of the entities that they represent, regardless of who the potential debtor is. So even though that's his brother, their brother still defrauded them, and they need to you know, move forward on it. Two, they owe money to somebody else now, too, and so it's their job to collect the money they're owed so that they can satisfy the people that may be coming after them for money that they've spent. Yeah, and, it could, and to be fair, it's not like these people – Although they're rich by Hampton County standards, these are not billionaires. They don't have unlimited resources. Okay, so the next question we have Debbie Eubanks asking, why isn't PMPED uh, filing criminal charges against Alec? I think at some point they will. You've got a a small uh, resources trying to go after years of financial corruption. And so they're at the back of the line as far as law enforcement is concerned in you know, doing, doing collection work on behalf of the law firm. Yeah. Well, then also when I was reading through these recent uh, charges that were against Alec, it's, I was interested in if you thought PMPED would be in trouble in light of these new allegations. I still don't think they'll be in trouble, but I still think they are all rushing to get personal lines of credit to cover the amount of money they had to pay out to their insurance company. Okay, next question is from uh, uh, Debbie again. If HIPAA is supposed to keep our medical information private, will we ever know what the psychiatrist had to say about Alec? If not, how can our Putlian take those records before the Supreme Court? That's a great question because HIPAA is uh, obviously something people are dealing with every day right now with the pandemic. And, and so the HIPAA rights, are held by the person whose medical records they are. Just like a spousal privilege is held by a husband and wife and only the husband or the wife can waive it, with HIPAA, you as an individual can waive your HIPAA rights and allow your records to be submitted to the court for their review. Uh, This question is from Patricia Brunson Manuel. Can the role of Palmetto State Bank be clarified? The settlement seemed to be more about the bank saving face versus the family. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's the Palmetto's role in this is, is limited solely by an agency theory that because the trustee was appointed, was an employee there, that they had some possible culpability and liability. And so it is much better for them to write a settlement check and be done with a claim than to spend excessive amounts of money defending a claim that they, they may or may not win. With the fact that he was using his position as, as the vice president of the bank, as well as the mailing address at the bank on legal filings, would that make them more culpable in this? Absolutely. It's, that's one of those, uh, you talk about actual authority and apparent authority. So even though his actions, you know, part of his job at the bank or had anything to do with his job at the bank, if he's out there telling people, you know, this is the address to send legal documents to, this is where you come to find me, that would be enough to create a claim and a colorable claim against the bank. So I have another question that someone sent me as a private message asking about the police reports and how heavily redacted they are, that once this case comes to fruition, will 
the information that's been redacted be available to the public? My understanding is no. They would be considered part of the district attorney's case file, which will remain, you know, out of view forever. It's a lawyer's work product, and it's it's confidential and not something that would be subject to a FOIA request or subject to a public disclosure. Okay, so I had a few questions. What happens if uh, to the state criminal case if the feds take over? You could have, theoretically, both of them going at the same time, where you could be convicted of state charges and convicted of federal charges, and you would not even have a consolidation of sentencing in that case. Um, I think those two separate legal entities are talking to each other, and they're developing a strategy and a plan on the best way to go forward. It may be that they are going to hold off on federal charges to see how the state cases go. It could be that they will wait till they're disposed of before they bring their their own cases. Or my guess, and, and again, the, the level of attorney that he has working for him, they are in daily, if not hourly, conversations with the U.S. Attorney's offices in South Carolina to get this all wrapped up and resolved at one time. And John, correct me if I'm wrong. I pretend I know things, but I don't. Um, but no, I talked to two federal, they, they work for one of the, both work for different three-letter agencies. Anyway, the, the general thought that both of them had was the feds aren't in general jumping into a case unless they know how have a victory. So they are not going to be early on almost anything. Am I correct on that, what, what both these guys have told me? That is exactly right. I jokingly talk about the Lord of the Rings with the Eye of Sauron. Once the eye of the federal government turns on you, they're going to come get you, but it won't be the first case out, and it won't be based on mere allegations. They like to have all of their ducks in a row, all their bows tied before they take action. And then when they do, it's a very quick process uh, because they've gathered all their evidence They've got all their witnesses lined up, and they've probably even been in the interim letting the target know that they are subject to a federal investigation, and maybe you want to come in and talk to us. They are not the first ones out of the gate, but when they do act, it's, you know, with the weight of the federal government. And we're taking a little break to talk about something we have fallen in love with, which is Green Chef. Seton, you just told me you're ready to go order some more, and so am I. Yes, I love it. There's so many... Definitely choices, and everything is pre-portioned, easy to follow. It makes cooking really simple, especially for a weeknight. Yeah, we're so busy, everybody, running around doing their things with kids and whatnot. So just get the Green Chef out. It's one little bag. You're good to go. It's America's number one meal kit for eating well, meaning the best meal kit, whether you're Cato, Paleo, vegan, vegetarian, gluten-free, or just want to eat more balanced meals, this is the way to go. And the, and the family love them? They love them, and... I don't have to go to the grocery store. That's right. That is a big thing. They come right, and you don't have to worry about missing an ingredient. Go to greenchef.com slash Murdoch10 and use code Murdoch10, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H-10, to get 10 free meals, including free shipping. Green Chef, the number one meal kit for eating well. All right, take a break for a moment. Talk about a new concept in glasses, sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. I'm talking about Warby Parker. I've been using them even before they signed on with us. Love the free home try-on program. It's awesome. Yes, this is the first time I've tried Warby Parker, and you get to order five pairs of glasses, try them for free for five days, and there's no obligation to buy. They ship for free, including a prepaid return shipping label. Yes, and I took the quiz, and I found out I needed wide. Mm. They have everything from extra narrow to extra wide. Yes, and the quiz helps you, and the selection, amazing. Uh, When I show people the Warby Parker app that allows you to do a virtual try-on, they're blown away. Remember, don't let your FSA and HSA dollars go to waste. Put them to good use in Warby Parker prescription glasses, prescription sunglasses, contact lenses, and eye exams. Glasses start at $95, including prescription lenses. Warby Parker is committed to providing exceptional vision care online and in stores. Try five pair of glasses at home for free at warbyparker.com slash Murdoch. That's warbyparker.com slash Murdoch, M-U-R-D-A-U-G-H. So we had a question about the motion to dismiss filed by Ellick's attorneys in the Satterfield case. 
Uh, they want to dismiss the civil suit saying that the family has been made whole because they've already received over $6 million of settlement money. So I wanted to get your take on that. Also, my question is, if it is possible that they would win this, why wouldn't everyone wait for someone else to pay up? In a multi-defendant or multi-plaintiff lawsuit, you will have different parties wait each other out to see what's going to happen. Um, I think one of the listener questions was related to this as well, which is, they have a very good chance of succeeding on this motion. That does not mean Alex isn't going to owe the money that's been paid out. It just means that he's not going to owe that money that was paid out to the Satterfields. They have released their claims. They've gotten checks. And they have now, you know, technically they've been made whole and their claims are moot because they're, they're done. And so I think I think that motion, again, what may appear to be unseemly to people outside of the legal system is what a lawyer should be doing for their client. Can you explain the implications of the motions that were filed by his attorneys on the civil and criminal trials? Yes. So the whole overarching idea of our judicial system is to make people whole. And so that notion is, you know, if your ox gets or gored, you get a new ox. You know, th- th- you, you try to make people whole. The idea behind punitive damage is you make somebody whole, but then the court has said, your behavior was so egregious, we're going to take this punishment that goes beyond the wholeness side and, and makes it act, you know, it, it's a deterrent for both yourself to do it again and for other people to engage in the same or similar activity. So in this particular case, their motion is they've been made whole, so the underlying principle of justice has occurred. And on the punitive side, the criminal justice system is coming after them where they have made an appearance and argued on behalf of what the state should be doing to punish Alex. And that's, and that's, so that's the combination of those two things. Also something we talked about, John, when we weren't on the air, was the difference between the civil and criminal cases and trials and why the attorneys for Alec Murdoch want the criminal to move forward before the civil. So the burden of proof in a civil case is more likely than not. And so it's the idea of a feather moving the scales of justice from, you know, exactly even to slightly in the favor of the party who's the plaintiff. And so that's the, that's the legal standard. The standard in a criminal case is beyond reasonable doubt. And so that means there's really no other answer than this is the person that did did the crime. You pointed out to me, though, was that when you give a deposition, for instance, or yeah, yes. to, that that's a game changer there, right? Yeah. So, OK, so so now why is that relevant in these cases and, and to that motion? In a civil case, if you decide not to testify using your Fifth Amendment right, that creates a civil presumption of of responsibility or guilt and that's the feather that the plaintiff needs to move the scales of justice in their favor then you can take that civil conviction and the fact that they've pled pled the fifth and and kind of use that as a sword in a criminal case to say haven't you already been found responsible for these same accusations so you can plead the fifth in a criminal ch- trial, and you're you're good with that. But if you plead the fifth in a civil trial, that's different, right? That's exactly it. it. So you have the presumption in a criminal trial. You don't have to testify, and if you don't testify, the jury cannot use that against you. In a civil case, they can use that as an indication of responsibility. 
Okay, John, uh, near the end here, there recently was this report about a trust under the father of Alec Murdoch. And it's confusing because it's trust stuff, but breaking it down to some basic layman's things, the thing that jumped out to you when you saw the information about this trust? The first thing is he did not believe that his kids should just get title to his estate outright, and he thought it should be protected, which makes me think he saw the handwriting on the wall, his kids either fighting with each other over how the property should go or how the property that he had given them during their lifetime was his lifetime was being handled and he wanted to keep, you know, his his hard work protected from somebody pilfering it away. Okay, so I think Sarah also had a take on that. Yeah, we have to keep in mind that, that Randolph the Third's wife is still alive and requires constant medical care and um and is still living in the family home. So I'm sure that some financial resources have been dedicated to her and the trustee would look over payment of those items. So we know that there have been these four indictments against Alec Murdoch, and there was one came down from Bamberg. And in this indictment, it explains how Forge was allegedly used because of the possible civil liability in the Mallory Beach boating case. So there were some attorney's fees, and instead of going to PMPD, they went to Forge. So I'm just wondering if the attorney who agreed to this uh, on the other side, if he could be in some hot water. I think everybody involved has to look at the source of funds and understand where something's coming from. And, and they're pretty big on that with CLEs and the bar associations across the country to say, You've got a responsibility to the public as a purveyor of public trust to know what you're dealing with, where it's coming from, and where it's going. And so anybody that wrote checks to or accepted checks from Forge are subject to at least some hard questions being asked at the, at the very least. But if this attorney knew that he was wanting to go through this Forge, whether he thought Forge was a legitimate company or not, just to basically protect his finances from the Beach family getting it. Isn't that a problem, too? No question. I mean, you got to be, again, you got to be on the up and up on handling money and and not hiding assets from creditors. Uh, John, I have a comment or question. We Because we've talked about before, and the old saying, and as a lot of people don't the old saying is you can indict a ham sandwich. So first of all, I want you to explain to people who have not heard that term why. And second of all, when you see the list of indictments, there are certain ones that I'm sure you look at and go, okay, that's one of those where we uh, they're throwing it in because it's a negotiation thing. And there's other ones that jump at you and say, okay, this is the real one. So can you handle both those uh, questions? Yeah. The, the common saying of you can indict a ham sandwich is, uh, a prosecutor can go into the grand jury and present evidence without any other side being present and say, this person did a bad thing. And so regardless of, of what the actual facts are, you could return an indictment on a lot of assumptions and very little evidence. And so an indictment is in no way an indicia of criminal activity or liability. That being said, with these particular indictments, they're transactional. And so they are following paperwork that in all these different counties where checks were written, checks were cashed, and money was dispersed. And so what you see is you see Alex driving around to different banks, so he's not hitting the same one all the time. Or the courier that he's writing the checks to or going to different places so that there's not a question about why are you back here again with another $10,000 check this week? And so that's, that's why these indictments are, I think, pretty solid. They're also coming at the backside of what are some lengthy investigations. And so I feel pretty good about the, the nature of their charges. And the reason you would do that is at the end of the day, the state wants him to plead guilty to something. And so 
know, by charging him with 27 different crimes in five different counties allows them to get him to, to cooperate and, and reach a, a you know, settlement through a plea uh, with the state. Right. So it's pretty common to put on like a whole bunch of things because you are hoping for these three or four main things. Yes. And so that's a, that's a common tool in both the state and federal systems where like in the federal system, it'll say, all right, we've indicted you on this. You should plead guilty to this. Or we also have all this other evidence on these other crimes that we're going to come back and indict you on. And so it's just, it's just a way to reach a resolution where there's, there's obvious evidence of criminal culpability. So we've also had some questions about the Satterfield Settlement Funds uh, and how large they were and how insurance companies determine how settlement funds are paid out. So imagine the, the $150 or $300 a month you spend on your car insurance and multiply that times every human being that has a car in the United States. Insurance company have a large amount of money to spend if needed. That's the first thing. So it's not that they don't have the the resources to pay it. Uh, they are looking at the culpability of all the parties and what they think a jury might do down the line to them if they were not to settle outright. And so the other part is South Carolina has a standard of what's called comparative negligence. And so comparative negligence allows people to recover easier than like a state in North Carolina that has a complete, if you're at all responsible for something, it's a complete bar to recovery in a, in a civil case, in a, in a personal injury case. And so it may be that they are looking at the numbers, looking at the accusations and deciding it makes sense to do a payout in this particular case with the Satterfield estate. So can you just explain what comparative negligence is for the layperson? Yeah. So if I'm in a car and I get hit by a drunk driver and I also happen to have had a beer while I was driving, they might say that the, the person that hit me is 90% at fault and I was 10% at fault. So if I was to recover $100,000 in that in a civil claim, I would only be eligible to get 90000 Versus in North Carolina, where that one beer, if I'm at all liable, I would not be able to recover anything. So... Another wonderful episode with John Snyder. We appreciate your questions. You can reach out to us on the Murdoch Podcast Facebook page. You can also go to the MurdochPodcast.com website to see the episodes and that sort of thing. We thank John. We are always appreciative to anybody who listens. We want to thank the folks at Peacock and Oxygen. They had us on on their Black Friday special on Crimecon, Seton didn't like looking at herself. None of us like looking at ourselves, but it was done well. Cool to be on the same show as Keith Morrison. <laughs> that was definitely a highlight, And but I, someone should have told me I should have been looking at the camera. I felt nah. I looked a little bit crazy. And thanks to Troy for uh, being on us, uh, with us as well. We've got another documentary coming up that we'll be featured on, and we'll give you details on that when it happens. Also, you have been putting on your Polar Express outfit lately. Yes, we are. my other side gig is Yoko Loco uh, Brew Tours in Fort Mill, York County, South Carolina, and we were actually doing a really fun Polar Express ride for kids. But yeah. typically we do brew tours. We're not taking the kids to the breweries. No, not yet. But uh, contact. What's the uh, website? It is yokologo.com. There you go. Rate uh, with a nice four-star, five-star thing if you love us. And also share this podcast to be much appreciated. And we will have updates on a lot of things that are pending right now as we'll get back to regular episodes of this podcast. Thank you so much. Talk to you soon. You may be into punk rock, soft rock, or classic rock, R&B, hip-hop, or house, country, techno, or techno country. 
But no matter what kind of music you listen to, here's something else you should hear. Please consider getting vaccinated. Talk to your pharmacist today about Comirnaty, COVID-19 vaccine mRNA. This message brought to you by BioNTech and Pfizer. Hello, Discover here to explain our cash back match. Here's how it works. We give you cash back for using your Discover card on the things you were going to buy anyway. Then we match that cash back in your first year. And that's why we call it cash back match. Now to recap and say cash back one more time. We match all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year automatically. Discover, exceptionally common sense. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Limitations apply.